Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco here. Well, for the new version of 1337 Wine TV. Um, all right, so real quick, we're gonna go over the, the format. Uh, we're gonna start with a value wine. This will be wines that are $20 or less. Try to keep it around 10 bucks. Um, and then we'll do a premium wine in the next segment. And there'll be a third segment, which you'll see We'll do a uh, somewhat of an educational thing, or it could be a question and answer type of thing, or it could be just a straight presentation. Um, it could be I did a short 10 minute interview with somebody. Um, it, it could be just a product demonstration review type of thing that, that's not a wine deal. So anyway, so that's what we're doing. So I've got my little, my little trusty handy dandy timer here to let me know where I'm at. All right, so ideally this should be a 30 minute show, plus or minus a minute or two for intro and outro, uh, and little ads in between. But uh, each segment should be about 10 minutes long. So, without further ado, let's get started. All right, so um, we're starting off with the value wine. This is the 2010 La Vieille Femme uh, from the Rhone Valley. And this is um, it's just because Vin Rouge. So this is a red wine. And it's uh, from the Rhone area, and it was $7.99 at World Market. Now, let's go over um, what this wine is. And uh, first, um, you know, kind of looking up the name of it, Vielle uh, is old. So uh, you'll see that with, uh, in combination with the French word for vine, so we'll say old vines, uh, Viennes. Uh, I think that's, that's how you pronounce it. Um, Ferme, or firm, or ferme, I don't know, not really sure how to pronounce the French, French word, but is, is a farm, or a farmhouse. So this is the old farmhouse, and coincidentally enough, where this wine is produced, there's a farmhouse on the property. So, therefore, uh, old farmhouse. So let's kind of go through this real quick. Um, uh, since 1970, they've been producing what they call authentic, honest, and tasty wines, vintage after vintage, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, they're owned by the Perrin family. They also own Chateau de Beaucastle, and uh, they, they get a wine. They get wines from all over France. And uh, let's see. The other thing I want to talk about here is that uh, the wines or the the, the, vin, the vines are grown on the lower slopes of uh, Mont Ventoux. And if you ever watch Tour de France, oh my goodness, when they ever when they do go to that part of France, um, this mountain is you know Ventoux is just well, first of all, when you get to the very top, it's just like there's nothing. It's like a moonscape because they, they chopped down all the trees like in the 12th century uh, to, for shipbuilding. So there's no trees on that place. And the winds are just insane. They, they've clocked winds up to 200 miles an hour from the Mistral, which uh, comes, through, comes through Rhone uh, every year, all the time. Not every year, but it comes through Rhone or the southern, southern east, so southeastern part of France. And uh, it's pretty darn windy, but they're, they're usually, you know, 30 to 50 mile an hour winds just constantly. So uh, one thing that I know that they have to do in, the, in that part of France is they have to protect the vines from the winds. Uh, not the only place in the world that has to do that, but it's pretty famous. They have to put some barriers up so that, you know, when, the flat, when they go through bud, bud break or they flower or the, the berries are starting to, to form that they don't get blown off. In addition to all the other stuff you have to be careful of. All right, so um, let's go over what's in this. We have Grenache, Carignan, uh, Cinso, and Syrah. So we have four different grape varietals. So now let's uh, let's kind of go through it. You know, nice little red wine here. Uh, nice color. Don't see too much variation. You know, don't see a whole lot of rim variation. Nice purpley garnet color. Not much on the legs there, but then again, this glass may not have been perfectly cleaned. There we go. All right, so let's get right into it. Mm. 
one thing I was reminded of in a Beaujolais tasting, which by the way was phenomenal, all 10 crew in one sitting, and we actually tasted like 13 wines. We tasted one crew, two vintages from one crew. And it was only two years apart and it was amazing the difference. But one thing we were talked about was, you know, yeah, you want to stick your nails all the way in there, but sometimes, especially well, they like with Beaujolais, maybe don't swirl the crap out of it. And you just kind of smell up here, which you, like you kind of do with liquor. So you don't like get burned, your, your nose doesn't get burned with the liquor. But up here, sometimes you get a little bit different aromas. Now with this one, you know, just generic red fruit. Um, I'm not gonna say I really get anything in particular. Not too much floral, maybe a little bit of earthiness. But also just kind of get, I don't know, not the alcohol, but just kind of a, a, a little bit of a burn on the nose. And I really don't detect too much wood on it. Well, maybe that's what I'm kind of, maybe I get a little bit of wood, but it's not like, it's not like I'm getting the typical wood characteristics. At least I'm not. Let's see how it tastes. Well, the first thing I got was a little bit more of the same from the, from the bouquet. That red fruit is thing. Next thing that really hit me is, is the tannins. I'm actually just kind of a little surprised. I know it has Syrah in it and Grenache can, can, be, can have some good tannins, but I was really just kind of surprised at how tannic it was. It's just in, you know, looking at it, it's not, it didn't seem like it's a really, really deep, dark wine because um, I kind of can see through it. But man, it really kind of hits me on the tannins. A little bit more than I expected. You know, kind of a medium, almost medium plus tannin. Um, and then after that, let's, I kind of got something now I've lost it because of talking. Again, yeah, you get kind of that, that sour, maybe like a sour cherry type of thing. Yeah, because we actually had some cherries at lunch today, and some of them were sour. I haven't had actual cherry in a while, you know, maraschino, you know, processed cherries, but um, but I also feel like I'm getting some wood now, like I'm tasting the wood. Finish is all right, uh, not really, really long finish, but um, you know, I, I, I don't, I personally won't really feel like I'm getting a whole lot out of this wine. Um, I'm getting the red fruits, the cherries, maybe a little sour cherry. Maybe I get a little floral component out of it, and I feel like I feel like there's there's definitely some wood uh, components. Like like I'm, I'm I'm I bit into actually a piece of wood. Um, it's not a bad wine. It's eight bucks. Um, balance wise, I I I don't necessarily say it's balanced, but I don't really feel like there's a lot of <clears throat> There isn't that much, I don't know, I don't really get a whole lot out of it. Um, it, it really tastes like just an ordinary wine, nothing, nothing spectacular, but um, it's definitely not the worst I've ever had. I mean, if I had a score, which I am going to score, I think I'd give it maybe, I don't know, what, what they said, I want to say they got a really good score on this wine. Maybe it wasn't this particular wine, they've gotten some good scores on other wines. I don't know, I, I'm just going to say I get, I, I'll give it like an 83. I'd buy it again. It's eight bucks, but I don't think it's really, you know, um, I don't think it's really just that over the top on anything. I want to see if it says anything about deep, deep cherry red appearance, nose, ripe fruit, rich and spicy, red fruit, black currant, blackberry spice, fresh fruit. I don't know. I, I know I just mumbled all that. You didn't hear what I said. Let me read what they said. All right. Nose, ripe fruit, rich and spicy. Palate, red fruit, black currant, and blackberry spice. Uh, with a fresh finish. I guess spice, I guess that's about the only thing I can say that I, after reading something, I got it. 83, 
if you're looking for something a little different, something from uh, southern France, from the Rhone area, check it out. All right, so uh, we're going to be moving on to our next segment, so uh, stay tuned for that. Okay, so now we are on to our next segment. Um, I'm not really sure how to do this now because I'm actually stopping in between segments instead of just going straight through. So it's not like I can do another introduction. <laughs> so, and, and depending on how you watch these videos, you actually will see a commercial. You just finished seeing a, an ad or a commercial. Uh, in other ways, you didn't see anything. You just saw the transition. And so experimentation on how we're going to do all this. Anyway, um, all right, so... On to our next wine for today. Uh, this is uh, going to be our premium wine. This is the 2009 Decoy Red Wines from the Napa Valley. Uh, now, D uh, $26.99 at World Market. So, you know, a little bit more expensive than uh, 8 bucks. So $27 versus $8. But uh, Decoy is from the same makers um, as Duckhorn. So... It might be not fair for me to say this is Duckhorn's little brother, um, but uh, they do source grapes from all over. Um, pardon me, they did say they source grapes from uh, from Napa, from Anderson Valley, and from Sonoma. So they source grapes from everywhere. They really, um, how they described it, they really put a lot of attention in the winemaking. They say the same type of attention they put with, with Duckhorn. Um, but these might be the I wouldn't say the lesser grapes. I mean, it's a twenty-eight dollar, twenty-seven dollar bottle of wine. So it's not like these are the the reject grapes, but these aren't the grapes from the same uh, from the, such from the higher prestige or the, the more prestigious vineyards in the area, Napa Valley or whatever. So, um, but anyway, uh, this is a combination, and I had to get back to that. Uh, it's a combination of Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon and Petit Verdot. Now, this is the different 2000, oh, this is 2010. Well, guess what? <clears throat> I didn't see that there was a different, uh, there was a different, oh, look at it, vintage, 2009. All right, let's do that real quick. Technical notes. All right, wow, it, not only just Merlot, Cab, Cab Sauve, Cabernet Franc and Petit Verdot. All right, so, 2010 vintage. Let's just kind of go through that real quick. So, you know, winemakers, like, they mess around with how many percentages of everything, and, and they do it all over. Like, it's kind of like their recipe. Um, and this may tie into the next segment a little bit, if I think about it. So, 2010 is 52% Merlot, 46% Cabernet Sauvignon, 2% Petit Verdot. This vintage, I love that. By the way, uh, Decoy Duckhorn, kudos on this website being kind of cool and very accessible, especially on an iPad, um, and being quick to be able to do this. Uh, all right, 2009, 46% Merlot, 43% Cabernet Sauvignon, 9% Cabernet Franc, and 2%, uh, well, hello, and 2% Petit Verdot. Oh, Max's wine dive is saying something to me. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so 100% um, French oak chateau style barrels. Now there were 60 gallon French oak barrels. They age it for 12 months, and both vintages said they do 5% new and 95% one year old, or they say second vintage. So, let's check it out, color-wise, okay? You know, a little bit deeper color. Uh, I don't always, the problem is I didn't really put a white sheet down here for me to really look. I mean, I got the white of the iPad. You know, I guess that's good enough. Not a whole lot of rim variation. It's a fairly young wine. I mean, it's only, what, it's just, two years old really, two and a half years old because we're in the middle of 2012. So two and a half years old, so we've considered a young wine. Um, low viscosity, which, you know, looking at the alcohol and looking at the viscosity, I would never have guessed that. It also could be just because I have, you know, the wine, the old wine might still be in there. Interesting. Not a lot of staining either on the glass. Okay. All right, so let's check it out. All right, so already there's a difference in, in just type of wine. I mean, the, the wine from the first segment and this wine, it, it, please, please let, let me tell you, I've had $8 bottles of wine that were very aromatic and tasted great. So it's no, no offense to the last wine, but there is a, there is a definite difference in quality already. 
It also doesn't hurt that there's different, uh, whatchamacallit, um, different varietals in here. So it's going to change things. So in this one, I get more of a typical California type of nose. Um, it's a little bit, it's a little bit of a vanilla, kind of vanilla, kind of creamy. Um, you know, that whole kind of fruit pie type of thing. I'm going to go with more raspberries rather than cherry on that. Maybe a hint of strawberry. You know, the wood characteristics with the vanilla and the and not the baking spices with, with the vanilla. Not much minerality on it, though. Oh, let's check it out. Definitely a, definitely a good one. I like it a lot. Um, it's got a lot going on. So first of all, still more the same with the with the uh, bouquet onto the palate. That 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 um, fruit pie type of thing. Almost no, we're not drinking out of the spit bucket. Um, kind of that fruit pie thing going on. I got a hint of the wood, and the tannins are are are, are I would say. Medium minus, okay? Not heavy on the tannins. Um, I get really just kind of right there and that's it. Um, not a whole lot or it's not really hitting me very hard. Acid is pretty good. Uh, some good acidity on it. I didn't talk about it in the last wine because I guess I just didn't really notice it as much. A bit of tartness to it, um, so not like super sweet. Maybe maybe a not quite a sour cherry, but a little bit of tartness to it. it. Might be where the 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 acids kind of influencing that. Finish is moderate. I wouldn't say it's a really long finish, but it's a good wine. Um, I can see really. I, I'm excited to pair it with something. Uh, whereas the other wine, I think I probably needed to pair it with something, but. Um, I think it's an excellent wine. Uh, it's fairly well balanced. Um, it's not a perfectly balanced wine. I, I don't think it is. I mean, it's not like it's horrible, but um, it, it feels like things are, are not quite in harmony, but everything's got good elements. And I've had some wines like that where the, it, it's got great elements and each element's really good, but it didn't look like a, like it's not like listening to a symphony where all the, everything's mixed just right or let's just listen to a, a, an album where you hear all the instruments, but they're mixed good. Sometimes wines like this, you kind of hear one instrument a little bit more than the other. It's still a great song, it's still a great mix. And it could be what the artist intended, was that you pick up on this thing a little bit more than something else. Something is meant to be a lot uh, more subtle. You know what I mean? But I really like that. I'm mean, looking forward to trying this wine just because I've had duck horn, I really like duck horn. And it'd be nice to get something made by the same people that's not 40 or $50 or, or more. I do like it. I mean, yeah, I, it's, I guess it's more balanced than I'm going to say than I originally thought. Uh, it's got some good balance to it. I guess just I really need to taste a little more. Uh, Score-wise, uh, yeah, I think it's a little bit better than, than I started initially thinking. I'm going to say I'm going to give it an 88 on the score. I think it's an excellent wine. Um, $27 bottle of wine. You know, if that's if that's meets your price point, if that's in your price range, uh, definitely go get it. You know, as always, as this is very subjective. Um, this is going to be a subject actually in, tom in next week's show about rating and scoring, but um, it's very subjective. I would say I would definitely recommend buying it. I think it's an 88 or plus bottle of wine. Um, it's just that you know how I am with 90s. I just I don't throw out 90s very often. So 
Somebody else may call this a 90 or 91.1. I'm going to call it an 88. All right, so um, definitely buy it if you find it in the store, especially if you can get it a little bit cheaper. And we're going to move on to the next segment. Hi everybody, welcome to Wine 101, or that's what this segment's going to be called today. Um, this segment's going to be one of those things where we talk about a subject that's maybe a psalm type of subject or just a general wine knowledge. It also could be one of the subject matters for the Society of Wine Educators Certified Wine Educator uh, uh, Program. Uh, it could be a question and answer thing. It could be a question that someone asked me just in passing or specifically I, I go out there and say, what do you want to know? Or it could be something where um, I'm doing a product review. Okay, so um, let's start off real quick. Why does bulk wine taste the same every year from Vinnie Crumbs? Vinnie Crumbs, or known as Dad, asks us all the time, why does, why does such and such wine taste, always taste the same every year? Okay, well, it really doesn't taste exactly the same every year. Okay, there's going to be variations. But let's kind of talk about why, the, why there has a similarity, of, say, among years with wine. Okay, first of all, you have what's called a house style. Now, um, this is really prevalent, say, in Champagne, where they, uh, they hold off what's called reserve wine. They hold off some wine, and I think I'm getting a little ahead of, ahead of the thing, but they hold off some wine, and they really try to blend all this stuff to make it all taste the same, have the same flavor profile from year to year to year for their non-vintage Champagnes. With regular wine, they do very something similar. They don't necessarily take stuff from prior years, but they create a house style. So a winemaker has his opinion on how his wine should taste, whether it's a single varietal, a, a, an actual blend, or it's mostly one variety, but he adds this, that, and the other, so he, it, you know, up to 25%, so he can still label it Chardonnay or Cabernet Sauvignon. All right, so how do you kind of get this sameness or, or say, say kind of a generic thing when bulk wine? Well, they get grapes from a whole bunch of areas. Now, we'll use California as an example. The Central Valley, which no one really ever talks about with wine, or at least as an AVA, because um, they just usually label it California, is an extremely fertile area. Now, they don't just grow grapes, they grow a lot of other produce there, but the, fer the fertility of the area allows them to have high yields. High yields have less concentration. Now, that just means that you get a lot of grapes, you get a lot of juice, and maybe it's not as bold and it's not as concentrated in the flavors, whereas you go to, say, a specific vineyard or a higher-end wine or even just a, a little bit better wine, and they, they run with smaller clusters or smaller berries because the wines the vines might be older or they may be making the vines struggle because of the climate, that type of stuff. These are, they're there to grow wine or grow grapes or oranges or lemons or apples or whatever. They're growing a bunch of this stuff and it's just, it's high production. Then they also do bulk harvesting. So again, you don't have that huge attention to detail that they're only going to, they're going to pick these individual grapes or these individual clusters this time or this day. And then they'll go through the same row tomorrow and pick a little bit. When it's time to harvest, it's harvest time. Like you're just harvesting wheat. All right, so fermentation, yeast. Yeast is hugely important, all right? Nobody really talks about yeast. We have this impression that, you know, they, they grow the grapes, they pick the grapes, they crush the grapes, something magical happens, they store the, they store the wine in these oak barrels or these stainless steel tanks or concrete tanks, and then they bottle it. And then, th then it just, it's just how the grapes are. Well, guess what? Yeast. Yeast is what really is going on here, is what really imparts a lot of your flavors and your aromas. Yeast, um, well, let's just kind of go through this quote real quick. 90% of winemaking has nothing to do with the winemaker. All a winemaker is doing is preventing spoilage, introducing some style characteristics, and bottling it. That's from Roger Bolton, University of California at Davis, UC Davis, Department of Viticulture and Enology. So this guy knows he's talking about. I got this from the winemaking homepage. I'll put a link below to it. Um, fascinating stuff. I, I've looked at this page before, but when I was doing my research, his, his, this guy's page came up with all these thousands of strains of yeast. Well, yeah, thousands, but like hundreds. Um, but what's yeast? What is yeast? It's, it's a single-celled microorganism. It's technically a plant, or it's part of the plant kingdom or whatever. It's not... A, I told somebody it was a bacteria, but it's not really a bacteria. But what it does is it, it converts sugar into alcohol. Now, 
we we talk, we kind of say it, it eats the sugar and it puts out carbon dioxide and alcohol, but in reality, it, it's the enzymes that are are doing a chemical reaction. So it's not physically eating and digesting it. There's a chemical reaction that's going on. These enzymes are what produce phenols, and that's your aromas and your your um, your your flavors. And that's why something tastes like apple because that particular enzyme in that yeast, you know, converted that sugar into something. All right. So um, while there's wild yeast on the grapes and in the old days, that's kind of how fermentation started. Uh, that some, sometimes that fermentation gets stuck so they can't continue the fermentation. So what winemakers do, especially with your bulk wines, uh, but all winemakers really do this, they'll uh, for the most part use what's called inoculated yeast. Now this is yeast that has predictability. These are the qualities of it. Predictability, quick fermentation. In other words, it starts the fermentation pretty quickly. Um, if you have native yeast or wild yeasts on the, uh, on the grapes or in the, or in the winery, they tend to they they'll tend to start fermentation kind of early before they actually add the regular the, the yeast they want to use, um, but they'll end up stopping at a certain point. So a lot of these wild yeasts will stop fermentation once you get to about five percent alcohol. So these yeasts can actually last a little bit high, a little bit longer. They can go up to 15, 18 percent alcohol depending on the yeast, um, but they, they 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 take over the fermentation process from the other yeast. So they just kind of muscle muscle their way in. They get started quickly. Um, they produce minimal residue or foaming. So depending on how the wine is being done, the residue is just the sediment that formulates the bottom. Those are the dead, dead yeast cell, dead, dead yeast cells. So it minimizes that. It makes it easier, uh, and they settle really quickly. It's called flocculation, and what does it makes it easier to kind of filter all that stuff out of the wine. Um, and they they actually go through a complete fermentation. They they finish eating all the sugar. Quote eating all the sugar. Uh, instead of having what's called stuck fermentation. Um, now, there are some yeasts that other people use that um, sometimes they have stuck fermentation. What they do is they'll use this kind of yeast or other kinds of yeast to kind of restart it. All right, so moving on. Aging. All right, so now we've, we've, we've converted everything into alcohol, so now we have our wine. So aging. All right, so they can use oak, stainless steel, concrete, um, so it just kind of depends on what type of wine it is, red, white, sparkling. Um, but each of those either imparts or prevents certain things from happening uh, as far as changing the, changing in the wine. So like oak, a lot of times oak is used to help add structure and complexity to wines. Um, when we talk about oak, it's typically American or French oak. Uh, there are other oaks from uh, Hungary and Slovenia but they're not used as much, at least not in the United States, um, and they have certain characteristics, but American and French are the ones you're gonna run into the most. New, old, or neutral oak. New oak is gonna have the most impact on a wine. Um, it's fresh, it doesn't have as much, um, uh, or it, has, it, it, it hasn't been used. Old oak is technically anything one year or older, um, has less influence. And then we have neutral oak, that's really old oak. That's like three, four, five year old oak, like, like, like five year old oak. And it's already gone through the winemaking process or the, the aging process enough so that it, it's, it's, not, it's not really imparting much characteristics to the wine. Stainless steel um, pretty much doesn't do anything to the wine, same thing with concrete. So what it does is it quote, allows the wine to mature on its own without any uh, influence by the oak. All right, oak characteristics. Um, below you've got baking spice, vanilla, actually tasting wood. Uh, and then there's also toasting with, with oak barrels. You have light, medium, and heavy toast. And that, again, influences the flavor of the wine. It also influences the color of the wine. All right, so now we've finished aging. Now the final steps, blending. I kind of alluded to that a little bit earlier. So now you've, you've aged all the wine, but each barrel has a little bit of variation. So what happens is to get that kind of sameness from the wine, whether it's big, big bulk wine or it's more of a smaller winery, they blend all the wine together before they bottle it so that they can get the right flavor profile that they want. Now, when you're talking about big, big bulk wine, it's, it's, it's like averaging out um, test scores. So if me, you, and two other people take a test, 
and our scores all over all over the place the averaging isn't so much you don't get that nice bell curve okay you just get data points but if you have a hundred thousand people take the test then you're going to have some averaging going on and you're going to get a bell curve and things are going to come out a certain way and it's going to be somewhat generic and you won't really you'll get an average so that's what they do when they blend lots of wine it just kind of averages out all the imperfections or all the weirdness and you just kind of get a generic uh, profile. Um, non-vintage, this is what happens a lot with non-vintage. Uh, depending on where you are in the world, you can, you can have a certain amount of wine from a previous vintage or wines from a previous vintages, uh, but still call your wine 2010. Typically, if it's 2010, it's all 2010. But depending again where you are in the world, you can have upwards of 25% of that wine from other vintages or, or just one vintage and still call it 2010. But your non-vintage wines, it doesn't matter. So your winemaker, like they do in Champagne, may decide, hey, I'm going to hold off. I'm gonna, I had some really good wine that's pretty decent. I like the flavor profile. I'm going to use it next year with next year's Carvis. And in Champagne, they do that a lot. They actually purposely hold back wine so they can create that house style. And then they, the really, really good grapes, they do the vintage. Uh, and that's what they call reserve wines. All right, so that's going to do it. Uh, I hope that helped explain a little bit why wines tend to taste the same from year to year. I mean, it has a lot to do with the yeast. They'll use the same yeast every year. So you're going to have the same flavor profiles. Uh, of course, the grapes are going to be the same. Uh, if you're in areas, I didn't talk about this in, in here, but if the climate's pretty much the same from year to year, yeah, there's variation you're going to get the same type of stuff, um, especially if you're like in a valley, like the Central Valley um, for California. It's going to be pretty much a lot of evenness as far as the grape growing and the sunshine and all that. But it really is, a lot of it is the yeast and then using the same techniques over and over. If I use the same type of wood every year, I'm going to get a style. And I hope that explains a little bit why a wine will taste the same from year to year. All right, so that's going to do it for uh, today's show. I went a little over on this segment than I wanted to, but uh, I'm really glad you, you all stopped by. Uh, I hope you like this format with the three segments, and we'll be seeing you again next time.